Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. I am honored to introduce our esteemed guest today. It's my boss, Doug Turchek. Doug, if you can give an introduction about yourself and your experience in information security for our listeners, that'd be appreciated. Certainly. Um, thanks for the opportunity to join you. The podcast really makes me think about un, you know uncommon facets of common topics, and you guys do a, a great job. So it's a, a pleasure to join you. Um, you know, it's uh, reminds me of the things that we should be doing. So often it creates more work for me, <laughs> but in a good way. So thank you. Um, I've uh, been in healthcare or in IT specifically for over 25 years. Um, started in desktop support and have kind of worked my way up. Well, primarily healthcare, although I spent about five years in uh, working for a startup in audio and video um, here in Madison, uh, Sonic Foundry. The last seven and a half years, I've been at Exact Sciences, where I had the pleasure of being the first IT person at Exact, which was a great opportunity to start IT from the, from the ground up. Um, a lot of consultants running around, and uh, they brought me in to kind of help herd the cats, so to speak. And you know, Consultants were doing what consultants do really well, which is try and grab more of the business and step on each other's toes. So um, it was just a great opportunity, a growing company. It was you know, easy to be, get behind the mission of eradicating cancer um, and you know, to join some incredibly bright, uh, enthusiastic, dedicated people. Um, on that mission. So, you know, it's all about, uh, you know, starting with infrastructure, but security has been part of what I've done since day one. As people climb up the career ladder, and this is kind of why we brought you on the show, is to get a security leader's aspect and point of view on all the things that we talk about, because a lot of what me and Adam talk about are the practitioner's view and implementing the tools and doing some influencing from our aspect and our point of view. But from your point of view, being you know one of the senior leaders in IT at the company and in information security, you have a much different focus on a daily basis. Things that I don't have experience in or just a, a basis of, of what that takes. So as you move up the ladder, when I think of it, I think of managing people and managing budgets. And so just kind of starting off with budgets, because that's something that I've never had to manage personally. You know, a lot of people have companies where they have a healthy security information or IT budget and some companies are strapped for cash when it comes to IT. They're on a shoestring budget. I'm sure you've been at companies with both ends of the spectrum. So when it comes to a budget and you have to budget for IT tools or security tools, how do you convince the CEO or the CFO that a new system or product is really going to be beneficial and it's going to be worth an investment? I think the most important part is to tailor your message to the recipient. You know, the CEO wants to know, you know, is it going to help maintain the nimbleness and the growth of his organization? Are we going to avoid being one of those organizations that show up in the um, on the newspaper or social media in the morning because they've had a breach and everything grinds to a halt? You know, how can we enable that continued growth and success? If it's a CFO, you know, they do have constrained dollars, even if the business is doing well, if they want to spend that money wisely. So looking at the investments that we want to make, you know, convincing them or demonstrating to them that there, there is value in that investment. Here's what you're going to get out of it if you allow us, if you support us in this investment. Um, you know, sometimes it's just reducing risk. 
you know, spending tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars on something like um, anti-phishing awareness and training programs. You know, we can demonstrate that, you know, fish prone clicking goes from 18 to 20 percent down to less than 3 percent um, through that awareness and training. And then, you know, relating that to reducing the risk of our ransom of ransomware in our environment because people are not clicking on links that they shouldn't. So that, that has a direct impact on the risk that they're seeing and, you know, the value for the dollars that they're investing in information security. Sometimes when you submit your wish list at the end of the year and you have this budget, you ask for all the things that you want for next year and then they cut things off of the budget, right? That there's the first cuts and then second cuts and people have to make sacrifices along the way. How do you deal with that if you have planned products that you want to buy or, um, projects that you have planned for that require investments and they get cut from the budget? How do you prioritize that? I always start with the risk evaluation and what is the impact on the business? You know, if we've got constrained dollars, we need to continue to focus those dollars on the most valuable assets, whether it's, you know, um, um, corporate information, patient information, secret sauce of the, of the things that we're doing. You know, making sure that we're protecting those things first. And, you know, as you both know, sometimes that doesn't take a lot of dollars, you know, good backups and, you know, and process and procedures. But, you know, probably the most valuable asset is, you know, our people on our team to make sure that we're um, working with the different business units and they're maintaining good security practices and such. But, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we can implement good security uh, activities. It doesn't always mean the most expensive tool. So maybe good is good enough for now, it's better than not enough, you know, or or not doing anything. But recognizing that we'll come back to that when we do have the budget to spend on, you know, on, on the ideal set of of tools and and technologies. I think that's something that all of us can take away is that we always strive to be unbreachable, but you know sometimes good is good enough you know we don't need to have the best in in at that time yeah it's hard to separate you know the, th the things that we have to do from the things we want or should do because we know what we're capable of we know what we can do and what we should do what i want to do but sometimes you know if budgets priorities timing other things sometimes we have to settle for something slightly less for now that doesn't mean i ignore it and forget about it I still want that thing. I'm going to come back for it. Uh, it stays on my list, but I recognize that maybe now is not the right time. Has anyone ever asked you in leadership to do something that's like really unfeasible? Like for example, some broad exception to a security policy or even something like it, not, you know, when you were, in infrastructure or at the support level, you know, specific equipment or software that they need or want, um, anything like that? Like, how do you deal with those types of requests? Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's hard to be in IT and not come across those requests. And everybody wants to be a full admin on their computers because they're too busy to collaborate with IT on, you know, installing software um, or, you know, securing their devices. Uh, I've I've had you know, executives come to me because they have an intern on their team that's supposed to be working on, you know, lab equipment, but also has some coding skills because they've taken some classes on the internet. And now they want to download a open source code library of some kind that can link to our medical records and update, you know, databases. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But, you know, if, that's it's a you know from their perspective they're not thinking about security they're thinking about what it can do for their business and efficiency and it, and so we have to have a discussion. Um, when I worked for a hospital system, um, I had a doctor tell me that you know the passwords that we were requiring on screensavers when it locked or when it timed out was endangering patients' lives in a in an exam room 
because it delayed their ability to meet with their patients. <laughs> so these are, you know, general practice physicians, not emergency room. So again, you know, we explained why we're doing this, the, why it's good for the business. Um, you know, when the physician walks out of that room and leaves the patient with an unsecured computer, um, it's somebody that just happens to have some computer skills. That, that's a big risk to the organization and to the other patients. So, you know, we have those conversations and typically people are reasonable when they think about it from a different perspective. Um, rarely do I have to, you know, say no. Um, often we can say, not that way, not what you requested, but there is a way that we can do this that maintains security, but, you know, it, it can be done, you know, and we can still meet your needs. It's amazing the power of a no, but kind of <laughs> statement where as opposed to just a flat blanket, no, you're saying maybe not that way, but let's think of another way where we can enable you to accomplish what you want to do to be productive. And we can also be secure at the same time. Yeah. And I've, uh, I've learned that I, it's a huge advantage if you don't even start with the no, and say, <laughs> Okay, I understand what you're asking for, but here's how we could do that. Mm -hmm. And because once you say no, their eyes glaze over and they see a wall. And so mm -hmm. you're already picking that apart. So it, you know, again, it's sometimes it's just recognition that security is not meant to be inconvenient. You know, it can be, but it's there for a reason and it's in their best interest. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a valuable point that you made right there, Doug, is that you don't start with no. That simple phrase of, I understand what you're saying and I I see what you need to do, but you know, here's how we accomplish that. So I, mm -hmm. that's great. So, you know, again, as you climb that corporate ladder, you know, one of the things that I fear, you know, if I ever get into management is that I'm starting to manage people more and I get less hands on keyboard. I get less time to do the fun stuff, the technical stuff. Um, is that something that you found as you move up the ladder and do you miss kind of being that hands on technical guru? Yeah. Um, certainly some days when I've spent my days, you know, in meetings and doing contract reviews and security questionnaires for, for healthcare partners and, and such is like, I just want to look at the list of vulnerabilities and tackle something that's that maybe I can affect change. I, I just, um, I, you know, I see other people on our team being able to, to investigate some anomalous behavior in the network. Uh, I'd love to be able to do that more, but you know, I still, I have the advantage of much the chagrin of our team. I get on the console from time to time because I I did have technical skills at one time and I still like to stay close to it, but I think that makes me a more effective decision maker on behalf of our team. If I understand what we're talking about, you know, I can recognize how those systems interact. I've got I maintain some level of technical skills. But, you know, as I think about this, it's really I I truly get joy out of, you know, helping really bright people have the chance to develop and shine. Um, I've, you know, I'm really proud of the people that I've worked with early in my career that now are leaders themselves. I have uh, one guy that I still stay in touch with on a regular basis was a university student here in town and an intern and oddly enough, always showed up on free pizza Fridays. Um, and now he's a VP of global PlayStation at or IT at Sony. Um, not that I made him a leader. He was going to be a leader, super bright, great people person. He had the skills, but I like to think that, you know, I, I was able to help clear his path so he could realize his own potential. Um, you know, it's again, it's, you know, setting them up to succeed and making sure that we're not discouraging them from, you know, a, a long and, and, you know, a career that they appreciate and value. But, you know, and also one of the people that, you know, again, as an aside, one of the people that worked with me at Sonic Foundry was, um, he was building SurveyMonkey on the side. And he, when he posted, when SurveyMonkey was, became a public entity, 
he talked about his team and the company on his website, and it was just him. <laughs> And then it was him and his brother, you know, and he was doing this while he was supposed to be doing the things that I was asking him to do. Um, but it turned out okay for him. So it's fun to watch. And, that, and that's truly what I enjoy seeing these, you know, super bright people become successful in their own right. Certainly. And, and if you didn't make the point, I was going to kind of ask you about that was while the joy of like solving a technical challenge is rewarding. Certainly there are other rewarding parts of the role. And, and it sounds like you've definitely latched onto one of them is, is really to develop people and to see people achieve their dreams and maybe achieve dreams. They didn't even know they had. And, and so that's really cool to hear that, you know, there might be different ways of, of discovering joy in the role, but they still exist. They're just maybe different than it might be for like an individual contributor. Yeah, absolutely. Adam and I talk a lot about soft skills and writing skills and communication skills in general being an important uh, thing to have as an information security professional. A lot of times when you think about InfoSec, you think the technical parts, the coding, the you know, the hands-on keyboard the guy in the hoodie behind the camera, you know, who's doing the hacking. You don't think about all the stuff that you have to do when it comes to communicating to people and selling a tool even internally. So I'm curious if you found any good techniques to communicate what you want as an information security leader to peers of yours who are non-technical, the business partners. How do you convince them that, something that you want to do or you want to implement that may affect them and kind of get them to go along with the program. Yeah. I think the more that I can convey the rationale for doing what we're asking for, you know, is it, it clears the path for them to accept and support what we're trying to do. I, we shouldn't be doing things if we can't justify it. If we can't explain, here's the business value, here's the, whether it's risk mitigation or, you know, or implementing um, just a single sign-on so that their em employees have a better experience logging into the applications and we're reducing uh, reliance on complex passwords. So there's there's a rationale for what we are attempting to, to execute. And the more they know about that background, the easier it is for them to become supportive. It, they, they also have projects and things that they're coming to me and want my support. And so it, it's a collaboration, um, recognizing that here's the things that IT or, or the whole organization is trying to accomplish. So there's some give and take, but you know, if we build up that, you know, the, the investment in relationships, then we can tap into that sometimes when we have to implement something that is going to negatively impact their team temporarily or a project they're working on temporarily, but they know that it's thoughtful and uh, we've done everything we can to minimize that impact. You know, my dad's been an engineer for my entire life and he never went into management. He just loves hands-on keyboard. And I'm curious if you were to go back to young Doug way back then do you think that you would have still gone into the leadership role, you know, as a fork in the road, if you were like, I'm going to go and be a manager or I'm going to get super deep technically into a topic and, and not worry about it, knowing what you know now and all the politics that has to happen at the, at the leadership level and all the meetings and uh, paperwork. And would you, you know, think maybe I'd be happier just doing my own thing, being a technical guru. What do you think you would do? Yeah, I, I think if I was young, Doug, and looked at what, what the job entails today, I probably would have shied away. But it wasn't, but that doesn't make it bad. It's, it's something that occurs over time and you kind of add to the, to the list of things that you realize that you're actually good at. I, um, I'm effective as, you know, as a decision maker or in a, you know, leader in IT, and I enjoy seeing the results of that activity. Um, and that, you know, kind of feed the beast kind of mentality is like, I enjoy that. 
Now, certainly there are some aspects, you know, personnel issues with underperforming individuals or something like that. There's, nobody enjoys that, but that's kind of the nature of, of what we do. But yeah, I think because it didn't, because it evolved over time, it wasn't like I woke up one day and all of a sudden I'm a manager and going to meetings all day and reviewing contracts. So um, I'm still, even today, picking and choosing and emphasizing the things that I'm good at and looking for support for the things that I need help with or the things that truly I don't have an interest, you know, and if I don't have an interest, it's the result of the, the output demonstrates, you know, that I don't have a passion for that particular aspect. But it's also my responsibility to look for somebody that can help support me um, for those items. I, I don't have to force myself to do it. I, I can get help and collaborate with others. So it's uh, self-awareness is critical at this stage, recognizing what I'm good at and the things that I could do better. You know, what's interesting, and I wouldn't have expected any other answer from an information security leader, is you talk about that. It's not like you woke up one day and said, holy smokes, I'm a manager now. When did this happen? Um, I, I went, I suddenly fell into people management. It was the result of many decisions over time. And one of the things that I found interesting many, many years ago, back when Texas Hold'em poker was all the rage. And of course, me being like a math geek, I studied it from a mathematics perspective. And one of the interesting things is about decision making with incomplete information. So you only have so much information when you make your decision. And if you make the right decisions, you can increase your win rate to be more often, but there is no decision that's going to be right 100% of the time unless you know all the cards. And information security is a lot like that, where you're only making decisions based on the information you have at the time. You can't look back in hindsight and second guess your decision making because you didn't have access to that information at the time you made it. And kind of talking about your career through that lens is so interesting in that it's a bunch of many decisions over, over a long period of time. And again, only made with the information accessible to you at the time. And so you're hopefully making the right decisions time over time, over time, and they lead you down a path and, um, Andy and I have talked many times how our career paths are kind of interesting and, and how we got to where we are today. And it was the result of many little decisions over time. And, and so I just thought that's, that's a really interesting angle and, and framing of it for our listeners in that some people might literally wake up one day and roll out of bed and say, I'm going to be a people manager today. And I'm going to go tell my boss, that's what I want to do. And that's fine. You can chart your course down that path. But for a lot of people, it sounds like, at least in your case, it was many little decisions um, on a day-to-day -day basis that I want to do this thing. I want to do this. And, you know, talking about what you would do if you had the full benefit of hindsight, you know, is an interesting exercise, but I mean, it's the same thing with like information security. We can make the best decisions about the tools and the practices and the policies and procedures we want to put into place. And hopefully many of them work out really well and they were good decisions. But even in light of something was a bad decision, we can't look back on it through that lens. We have to look back on the information we had available to us at the time. So yeah, I'm a big interesting tie in there between career and, and um, practice. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a big believer in and not looking back and second guessing those decisions, as you said, it's we made a good decision based on the information we had at that time. Now I'll look mm. back far enough to see, you know, look for opportunities to avoid that same mistake in the future. Uh, I want to learn from those opportunities, but not necessarily because I right. was right or wrong, um, but mm. but because if I'm presented with that same information in the future, I've got new <laughs> new data that I can include in the in the evaluation. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and from a manager's perspective, you know, I've had a lot of colleagues and friends who thought they wanted to be a manager. They were technicians and engineers, and they started having people uh, reporting to them. And they were miserable because people are unpredictable. You know, a system, I can configure it and I have an expectation of how it's going to behave. Mm hmm. But a system doesn't come in, you know, with the at the height of multiple projects and short timelines and announce that they're pregnant. <laughs> you know, so it, you know, also you have to be able to think on your feet you know, and adjust and adapt and and you know, it's unpredictable. Uh, every human being has their own struggles, and as managers, I don't know what what our, every individual is feeling and experience on that given day. So I have to be adaptable. Um, and recognize their strengths and weaknesses and how I can support them and, 
you know, things that I can do to help them, um, which will then come back to help us. Um, but that's, you know, being an effective manager. If I, if that made me uncomfortable, then I wouldn't be a good manager. You know, one more point adding on to what you just talked about that you triggered in my head was that you talked about how technology tends to be very binary. I mean, no kidding, right? That's, that's the foundation of it in that if you do this thing this way, it will generate this result. And not only are people unpredictable, but Hey, anybody who's a parent of young children has learned this as well, that you can like go through the process the right way for bedtime and you will get this result one night and this result the next night and this result the third night. And it's enough to drive you crazy. And for some of us, technology is our retreat because it makes sense. It's, it's predictable and the behavior is consistent and you make a great point that for people and technologists who love that aspect of the job you are going 180 degrees away from that with the unpredictability of people and emotions and and um, working relationships and everything else and that can be fun but it's a different skill to manage and to understand and to develop it is you know and the people that mm -hmm. are attracted to the technical fields tend to be the linear you know, binary thinkers and, and, you know, to have the ability to, you know, apply some creativity and innovation and empathy, you know, in your day to day uh, activities uh, can be a challenge, but that doesn't make it good or bad. I mean, there's some people that were just meant to be in technical roles and not management, or there are people that were meant to be in management roles and maybe not technical, they weren't the strongest administrator or engineer. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it's recognizing through experience your strengths and weaknesses and putting yourself or, or putting your team uh, members in a position to be successful. One of the things that I think about that I think you did when I started out at the company was I made a bunch of mistakes and maybe, you know, deployed something or turned on a policy that broke something and impacted the business. And I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you kind of shielded me a little bit from the wrath of some of the other managers. And, you know, I think a good manager kind of, you know, it wasn't that you didn't talk to me about it later on, but I think that good managers will take the brunt of that you know I, i'm not sure what was all said but i assume that you kind of maybe said that it was our fault or you know maybe explain it in a certain way but you you took the brunt of that and then it didn't roll downhill from there yeah i think that is a responsibility as you know as as a leader manager or leader is to you know work with the work with the rest of the organization to say, own up to the fact that something didn't go as we expected, or somebody made a choice that impacted the business that, you know, was not the best choice. But the working with, you know, my direct reports is between me and the direct report. You know, here's the opportunity, here's how you, we will do this differently next time. You know, do you recognize that things could have been better and so that we don't repeat that? It, it, Truly, I'm, I like to hire people who are committed and we're going to make mistakes. That doesn't make you a bad person or bad employee. It means that you're learning and that we'll, next time we'll do it better. Now, if you keep making the same mistakes over and over again, that's a different conversation. Um, but mm -hmm. that's not a conversation for 15 angry people to have with you. That's, that's something that we work out. And I want them, my colleagues, the other managers to know that I've got this and I respect them enough to know that they've got it when somebody on their team is challenged. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll let them know when somebody on their team, you know, impacts us in a negative way, but I know that they are, I expect that they'll take care of it. So it's, you know, again, it's making sure that we're, we're treating each other as humans and, and continuing to learn. And it doesn't make us bad people when we make mistakes. I mean, that's the epitome of a growth mindset is having a place where you can make mistakes. And as long as you're learning from them and adapting from them, that can be a powerful learning tool. Having the fear of never making a mistake 
inhibits creative thinking, inhibit, inhibits um, new ideas and, and new ways to go about your business. So um, having an, an environment where not that failure is encouraged necessarily, especially in infosec because failure is bad, but at least where we can, we can recognize mistakes and find ways to do better and grow from them and not in an environment where we're absolutely fearful of any mistake is, is going to be better for people to learn and get better and honestly secure the business and enable it better too. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it, keeping it in perspective, I often, one of the critiques that I get is that people feel like I don't have a sense of urgency. They're in, interpreting my calm demeanor as, <laughs> as if I don't care, I don't feel like it's an urgent issue. And that's not the case. It's, you know, I am focused on, you know, resolving the issue that's at hand, taking care of getting the business back and running and doing whatever we need to be doing. And then after the fact that we're in that analyzing it and understanding what could have been better, what we can do differently, um, it's absolutely urgent. I don't want to be the speed bump for the business. So I'm, I have a sense of urgency, but that is not the same as running through the hall with my hair on fire. Um, leaders don't want to see me panicking. You know, they want, they want to know that I've, you know, I understand this is not good and we're, but we're taking care of it. Um, so it's, especially for people who tend to wear their emotions on their sleeves, they have trouble understanding, um, <laughs> calm and cool, <laughs> but what I need to do is, you know, and I've had this conversation is look at the results. Um, you know, people are less effective when they're feeling stress. And if I'm showing stress, they're feeling my stress too. Um, so it just makes us less, less effective. At, resolving the issue. So information security in general is a very stressful career field for a lot of people. And I think at an enterprise, sometimes it can be very underappreciated. A lot of people, even when you try to come across with empathy or try not to impact the business, inherently a lot of the things we do are impactful and can cause stress in users and, and employees lives and how they go around their business. And so it can be very thankless. And so I guess as a people manager in information security, as an information security leader, how do you keep your team motivated and focused in, even though they may be feeling underappreciated or burned out? Well, you know, what we do, I think, is a team sport, you know, and so it's it's critical that they understand, you know, the pressures that we're under and, you know, and but feeling like that we're all working in the same direction, rowing in the same direction and that we've got each other's backs and you're not in this alone. And that's really when you're going to struggle, you know, the, the pressure will mount if you feel like you're on an island um, dealing with that stress. So if you know that, you know, maybe I've got a little bandwidth and I can help with that particular situation for right now. Um, next time when you've got a little bandwidth and I'm feeling under the gun that you'll help me. Um, but it, it's, you know, making sure that we stay focused on what we're trying to achieve, what are our priorities and not distracted by maybe the pressures of, you know, there's everybody that comes to us with a request feels like their request is number one. And we just have to recognize that and, you know, work with them. You know, my primary job is to work with them to understand that we can't do five number ones. Um, and here are the things that we're balancing and they can help, you know, either support or understand why their request is being delayed maybe. Um, but for the team, it's recognizing that we're in this together and, um, you know, we have an opportunity to be successful and, and not absorb all the stress that comes with our roles. There was an article that came out actually this week in op-ed. I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but one of the points that this professor who teaches IT at a university made was, he wanted a one mistake type 
situation where if a company had a breach and it was the fault of the information security people that they would be fired. And in fact, uh, one of his points was that they should never be hired to work again at another company in information security. So uh, I think there's often, especially for security leaders, I can only imagine that there's a lot of stress on preventing breaches. And if you do get breached, you know, maybe there is that fear that you will get fired or, or let go due to that. Um, do you, do you think there's any validity maybe not in your current position, but in general, do you think among your peers in the industry that there, there is that, uh, fear of job security when it comes to the role of being in, in like a CISO position? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's validity to the fear. Um, but I think it is becoming less common. Uh, one thing is, uh, in good or bad, recognizing that there are breaches are common enough that it's not a death nail for the company. It's a disruption, and, and nobody wants it. In, in no way do I want to insinuate that it's okay and we'll get through it. We want to avoid it at all costs, but it's not the end of the road. Um, consumers... Uh, customers are, are have a fairly short memory if your if your product is valuable, but regardless, good leaders recognize that uh, you know breach to some degree is inevitable for every organization. We're going to have one. We've been very fortunate at this point, and because we have a good security posture, we're doing the right things. Um, but a breach is not because of one person. You know, I think you know again if effective security is a team sport. Uh, on the other hand, my job sh should be at risk if they keep occurring or we weren't doing some of the basics, like MFA or anti-malware or patching or, you know, those kind of things. It, that's inviting a problem. And that could be grounds, should be grounds for suggesting that I'm not in the right position. But an individual breach or, or or a breach of a vendor which breached us, you know, those kind of phenomenon that are common today. Yeah. Should the CISO be fired because solar winds had an ineffective, you know, code process? Probably not. Or there'd be 18,000 CISOs out of work right now. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it depends on the circumstance, but I do think it's becoming less common for a CISO to get walked because uh, to walk to the door just because of an of an individual breach. You know, one thing I think of as well as concepts like defense in depth become more broadly practiced and deployed, and you know maybe we we start to broaden our language over time. So in my personal role um, at Microsoft as a as a security executive. Um, they really discourage us from using the B word. So I tend to say like a security incident, maybe, um, depending on what we're talking about. But I, I think even that, like our understanding is gonna have to evolve over time because our, our goal hopefully should be, like you said, maybe some sort of intrusion is inevitable, but if we can limit the scope of that intrusion, so you can't get very far, like the, the attacker got into one endpoint, we're able to isolate it quickly. Uh, there was no lateral movement because credential guard was enabled on Windows 10. Um, so they weren't able to pass the hash or do anything like that. And, and ultimately we, we wiped them out quick. Like in theory, there was an intrusion, but they didn't get anything. They got one endpoint and we keep all our data stored elsewhere, especially sensitive information. And so it wasn't, you know, I don't want to say not a big deal, but that's very, very different than than an incident where a lot of customer data was accessed and potentially exfiltrated. And so um, that's probably the, the next step over time is intrusions will be not entirely uncommon, but as companies get better at defense in depth strategies and are able to stop those attacks earlier in the kill chain, um, they'll be less impactful to the business because less sensitive information will be accessed or exfiltrated and ultimately you know, even the the requirement of disclosing of that security incident becomes smaller because very, very few people would have even been potentially impacted. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing to watch over time as well as maybe the, the volume of incidents increases, but the severity of incidents decreases. That's kind of, I think, the goal where we're trying to get to um, is something more like that. And you know, curious to hear your thoughts on that too. But as from, from my perspective, that's what I kind of see as, as a longer term goal for sure. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that has been our experience as well as we recognize with the, um, you know, exchange server uh, incident that occurred a, a few weeks ago. You know, we had um, server on-premise servers that were impacted by that, but because of how they were isolated on the network and segmented and the traffic was controlled and things, we didn't have to immediately panic. Um, certainly, we took it seriously and did our analysis and looked at all the you know the fingerprints and followed the breadcrumbs and all those kind of things that we we did immediately uh, isolated it and took it down all those um, activities that you should do. But we knew that the you know the potential impact for that was controlled. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that we do too is on a regular basis. I'm when these. Uh, events happen in the news, I send proactive articles to the leadership and say, here's what happened, here's what we know at this point, here are the things that we're doing as a reminder that to, to avoid you know, being that company, we're segmenting the network we have, we're separating credentials, administrative or privileged access from, into separate credentials, sets of credentials, so if my normal email account is compromised, then my administrative credentials are still secured. Um, so the, the, all the things that we're doing to mitigate that risk is just in bullet points, because much more than bullet points isn't going to get absorbed. Um, but it's saying, you know, we are taking this seriously. And if it does happen to us, it's not going to be a take the whole company down. Um, it's a, you know, this business unit may be disrupted temporarily or this you know, process may just dis be disrupted temporarily, um, but we've we can turn it around quickly because we've taken those proactive steps. Keep shrinking that blast radius, get exactly. it smaller. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that kind of breaches may be inevitable and it's not going to be the end of the company, but a lot of times the work that we do in the industry is at a company is it's really hard to tell if you're actually doing a good job, because again, we're impacting users sometimes with the tools that we deploy and it's kind of like no news is good news type deal. Um, so it's really hard to measure success. Do you have any insight on how you determine whether or not your team is successful or maybe any a particular metric or KPI that other security leaders might be able to take away if you had to give some advice? Yeah, I think this this is probably the hottest topic in, in you know with uh, my colleagues at the information security officer level um, right now is because how do we demonstrate our value? Um, you know, we've <clears throat> we go through continuous cycles of iteration in our metrics, and I've been focusing, as you know, we've been focusing the evolution of our metrics to demonstrate value over volume. You know, it's interesting to know that we blocked 35,000 malicious emails last month. But f what does our CEO do with that information? Is he going to change our, you know, direction of products or our priorities? Probably not. But, it, you know, it's, it's valuable to know that we convinced three new health systems that our security posture is strong enough that they're willing to share patient data with us and order our product that's valuable to the CEO. You know, it's demonstrating a value to what we do and how we spend our time. So, you know, I continuous, it's a continuous battle and focusing on what resonates with them, um, getting away from just the pure volume of, uh, of activity that's going on because it's, it's not actionable. But, you know, again, it's, relating it in terms that they understand, you know, the, the reduction in fish prone clicking, you know, is something that they understand because they know the implications, they read the articles, they know the implications of clicking on a link or opening a malicious attachment. So um, again, it's, it's kind of those things that we're focused on um, more than volume. This is also kind of a hot topic in the infosec industry in general. I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts are. You know, and I, I did a lot of thinking about it this week as well. And I'm sure uh, you've been thinking about the hiring process in general and, and candidates and um, 
you know, as you're trying to build up the team at our company. I'm curious because in other industries, there's oftentimes new graduates who will just get a job, like let's say in marketing, right? Like you graduate with a marketing degree and you go and get hired as a junior person in marketing at a company. Plenty of people get a degree and go into the job market. I mean, it has to happen that way. Otherwise we wouldn't have anybody going into the job market after they graduate. Um, And now there are degree granting programs at universities for cybersecurity, two-year programs, four-year programs. There's a lot of certificates out there, online resources where people can gain valuable experience. A lot of folks still think that they want someone who is more experienced in information security when they're looking at these roles, and there's not as many entry-level roles. Like, Do you think that it's possible? Maybe it's Maybe it's when you have a larger team and you have that, bandwidth to mentor someone and bring somebody up. But I'm just curious if, if you think there's a place in information security in general to have those entry level positions to bring in someone who's newly graduated from program into your company and on your team. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think it's the challenge is striking a balance between having the experienced people there um, to, you know, get the higher level activities um, done to take advantage of their skills and experience that they've, gained over the years, but also to serve as mentors for the the ones that are just fresh out of school or have taken an unusual career path and are interested in a cybersecurity career at this point. I'm a huge proponent of four-year degrees because I think you learn a lot, um, not necessarily in the courses that you take, but the experience of being exposed to a lot of different cultures and people and having to do group projects and live with strangers in a dorm. I mean, there's some, there's all kinds of value in that, um, that which translates to the kind of things that we have to do in the workplace, especially when we're all in the office. But there are some non-traditional routes, um, more so today, as you described, you know, with the, all the learning available on the internet now through certificate programs that are free or nearly free. Um, the education that you can get to spin up your own labs. I, you know, My focus is looking for people who are curious and passionate about information security. You know, they showed a, a, a desire to learn. They've taken their cert- certificates or maybe that they've, you know, put some time in on the support desk and learned about hardware and, you know, at that, and now they're transitioning into cybersecurity. Um, you know, if, if they want to learn and, it, and it's hard to get from a paper resume, um, but if they can demonstrate their curiosity and, and desire to learn, then we absolutely want those them on our team. Because, you know, again, you can't teach that side of it. We can teach you the skills. I can show you how to use a SIM. I can show you how to use the individual tools. But I can't teach you how to be curious and to ask questions and uh, to think analytically about a situation. It's like something just doesn't make sense. I'm going to dig into that. Um, mm-hmm. And those are the things that, you know, really, whether you're experienced or, you know, fresh out of school, out of program, or, you know, fresh out of high school and you've had a couple of internships, those, you know, those are the things that we want to balance our team with experience and, you know, fresh eyes. When I first came into the IT workplace, one of the things that surprised me more than anything that I was just blown away by as a fresh college graduate from Iowa State University was that people were change resistant in IT of all businesses, in technology. Like, how can you be change adverse in technology? Like, that never made sense to me. And so information security is takes that even more to the extreme where if if you don't love change and you don't love learning about change and being proactive to adopt change and learn about new attack techniques and new um, tools to prevent those attack techniques and everything else, you're in the wrong business. And so I think your focus there on, on, you mentioned repeatedly curiosity you know, willingness to learn, growth mindset. Absolutely. And and there's multiple ways to get there, as you, you mentioned as well. A um, lot of benefits to the traditional four-year program, um, but there's, there's more than one way to show that curiosity, that insatiable learner kind of attitude, and then also to have that 
almost biological anomaly detection, I guess I would say, where you can look at something and be like, there's not something that's not right here, and I'm going to dig into it more. Uh, those are all really good points on identifying folks who would be successful in information security. Great yeah. insight. And, and it's hard to see it from an interview. You know, you have 30 minutes with a person, but, you know, there is, you know, there's a tone to the language that they're using about the the projects that they worked on in school or the lab they built in their basement bedroom and there's, or the class that they took um, online. So there's, you know, there are ways to, to kind, of, kind of peel that out. Um, but I think, you know, too often, and we've had this conversation with our HR team, is that if you don't have the right acronyms on your resume, you automatically get filtered out. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes, you know, if it doesn't say SQL someplace on it, that doesn't mean that you're, you can't be in, you know, in cybersecurity. So again, it's also educating them on new ways to look at people, um, you know, especially as we're focused on inclusion and diversity, they don't mm -hmm. often, you know, often don't have a traditional learning path, um, mm -hmm. but that they're incredibly bright, you know, capable people that, you know, just didn't have the traditional path that, that we're so accustomed to, but they would make great employees because they're hungry. Um, and so that's, again, we need to think about it differently than maybe what we did, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Well, and certainly attackers are diverse. They come from all around the globe, from all different countries and backgrounds and religions and ethnicities. So if our defensive teams don't look like the attackers, then we're going to have blind spots. I mean, that's, that's the other point too, our match our adversaries in that sense. Yeah. You know, and I, I can speak personally from, you know, coming out of college with a degree in geology. <laughs> <laughs> I went back and got my teaching certificate because I loved, you know, teaching science and computer science. Um, but while I was waiting for my first teaching job, I took a computer job because it was a great way. Computer classes were a great way to get out of math credits. When, when I went to the best school in Iowa, the University of Iowa, Oh, and so, <laughs> um, so, you know, but it is for, for me, it was the curiosity of how can I use these computers to help the business do what they're trying to do? They, they had no idea what the computers were capable of at that point. You know, mm. this is dating myself. It is early on. <laughs> but, you know, they could actually save their documents and you know edit them rather than print them out and delete them and go you know as if it was a typewriter <laughs> so anyway is being able to show them how we could use these tools and it's no different today how do we use these tools and this great technology that we have at our fingertips to to enable the business and be innovative and, and continue to grow and but do it securely protecting the data that we're we're entrusted with um, and protecting the, the secret sauce of our organization so we can continue to grow and affect people's lives by eradicating cancer. So it's, you know, again, it's all tied together. Well, Doug, I really, really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to entertain us here and, and talk to us about what it's like to be a security leader. If our listeners have questions and maybe they might want to reach out to you. Do you have a preferred method that you would want them to message you? Probably. Uh, well, that's, that's a good question. We can talk about that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll uh, have something in the show notes if you guys want to reach out to Doug. Yeah, I, I would absolutely encourage it. I think, you know, I, I learn from the interactions and the questions that I get. Um, I, you know, I'm not dodging good questions and stuff, more dodging, you know, I'm the security guy. So I'm, I'm skeptical about who's got my information. So, um, you know, making sure that it's, you know, legitimate requests, not trying to sell me something. But, it, you know, again, it's, you know, I love the conversations and I appreciate what you guys are doing, you know, for security and through this podcast. So it's certainly a pleasure to participate. Well, thank you. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or comments about the show. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. 
Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.